And good evening, everybody. Uh, glad you're here. You notice I have my Gatorade Zero here. I'll fill it up by Sunday so that I can finish the uh, Mysteries of the Bible sermon. But the real reason it's here is because this is the bottle we need for Vacation Bible School. Gatorade Zero. Now they have actually experimented with several other bottles and the other bottles don't work. So we think to improve your health, you need to drink Gatorade Zero. Any flavor, but that's the bottle we need. How many, how many of those bottles we need? 40 or so of them? Um, so uh, drink up, Gatorade Zero, save the bottle. Uh, or, and you'll be a hero. Not a zero. There we go. <laughs> Be a hero by drinking zero. We'll get it here. Um, and uh, glad uh, all of you are here tonight uh, as uh, we come into Bible study here in just a moment. I uh, had uh, some good fellowship. Let's see. I got another announcement, and that is now that we have just eaten, um, Sunday is potluck lunch. So we're going to eat again on Sunday. And um, I will send out something tomorrow and include you in it. And uh, then you can just reply what you're bringing so that we don't all bring mashed potatoes. Uh, and uh, we'll have a good lunch Sunday after church, so uh, plan on that. And uh, the sermon on Sunday will be, uh, what, is it still there? Uh, we're, I'm going to teach Philippians at 945. And, uh, well, there it is right there. All the Mysteries of the Bible, part two. So it'll be... Not all the mysteries of the Bible this Sunday, but uh, half of them we had uh, last Sunday and tonight we come back to the Feast of Israel, the Passover part two. Uh, if you weren't here last week, we'll, we'll get you up to speed, but let's go ahead and have a word of prayer first. Heavenly Father, thanks for a beautiful day here in Taos, and thanks for these who have joined us right here in this good crowd, but also uh, many others who join us online now, and uh, we, we join together in uh, a... a a, uh, a real pew or, uh, or, or a virtual pew tonight and uh, come to study the Word. And we pray that uh, understanding the Feast of Israel would help us to understand uh, the body of Christ, certainly separate from uh, Israel, but uh, there are so many things that we can learn about uh, the workings of God down through the years and even how that uh, may apply to us in some examples. And we ask that we would uh, rightly divide the Word of Truth uh, according to your glory tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. So, we started uh, three, three weeks ago looking at uh, the Feast of Israel. We had a little overview and we looked at the one weekly feast, that is the Passover. And then last week we started the first of the annual feast. We talked a little bit about the timing of that, when it comes. And uh, then we began to talk about the biblical observance, the Passover in Scripture. And uh, we looked at that uh, from Exodus chapter 12, but we didn't quite get all the way through, but uh, no problem because I happen to have Exodus 12 with me. And if you want to follow along, you can either up here or uh, in the Word of God uh, that you have. We went through verses 1 through 9, so we're going to go through that very quickly just to get ourselves up to speed as uh, Moses spoke to Aaron and, and Moses and Aaron in the wilderness this month. Remember I said this month was never named until Esther and Nehemiah. And later on they called this month the beginning of months, the month of Nisan. Here they called it this month. And it's, all, it's never called anything but the first month. It shall be the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year to you. Speak ye unto all the congregation of Israel, saying, In the tenth day of Nisan, they shall take unto them every man a lamb, according to the house of their fathers, a lamb for a house. Now, we discussed last week that uh, the rabbis disagree on this. Uh, some of them say that they selected their lamb on the tenth of the month all the way through the time of Jesus until the destruction of the temple. Others say, no, actually, they only did that this very first year. Uh, and so it was only done once. And after that, they certainly did select a lamb somewhere. So whatever it is, they were to select a lamb ahead of time on the 10th on the, uh, of the month if they were carrying this out. And if the household be too little for a lamb, let him and his neighbor next to him, uh, his house, take it according to the number of souls. Every man, according to the eating, shall uh, make your count for the lamb. Again, the rabbi said, 
uh, no more than 10 people per lamb. Going on to verse 5, your lamb shall be without blemish, a male of the first year. Uh, you shall take it from the sheep or from the goats, because remember the word lamb is the word for, we might say, kid. Uh, from the sheep or from the goats. Uh, later it became uh, exclusively sheep. Uh, and tonight we're going to learn what they eat in the modern Passover. Sheep, goats, what do you think? No. no. Pot, roast. Pot roast, you got it. <laughs> and, uh, and we'll talk about why they eat pot roast today, roast beef. Uh, you shall, n not always roast beef, but often roast beef, uh, and, and really never lamb. Uh, ye shall keep it until the 14th day of the same month, and the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it in the evening, and they shall take of the blood and strike it on two sides of the posts, uh, on the upper door, uh, posts of the house, wherein they shall eat it. We talked again a little bit of the background and why they're doing this and what's going on and what it could have meant last week. And they shall eat the flesh that night, roast with fire, unleavened bread, with bitter herbs they shall eat it. Now, this is what we have in the original or the biblical Passover, I should say. Actually, uh, in... Uh, all of the various passages that describe the Passover, there's never anything except the lamb, the unleavened bread, and the bitter herbs. That's the three things in the biblical observance that are given. Eat it uh, not raw nor sodden at all with water, but roast with fire, his head with his legs, with the pertinence thereof. And pertinence, sometimes you're glad you come to the King James and it says the pertinence thereof rather than the details of what the pertinence might be. But uh, there we have it. Now we're going to pick up there in verse 10. Ye shall eat nothing, you shall let nothing of it remain until morning. That which remaineth until the morning ye shall burn with fire. A pretty simple uh, explanation there uh, that uh, no leftovers, eat it if you got leftovers. Come morning, burn it with fire. Again, later on, the uh, rabbi said uh, that is by midnight. And so uh, even today in modern Passover, uh, by midnight is when uh, the, uh, the Passover dinner is to be done. And thus shall you eat it with your loins girded, your shoes on your feet, your staff in your hand, and ye shall eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. Now, we... Uh, we, we, we talked just a little bit of last week about maybe one of the reasons they roasted instead of, uh, instead of boiling it or uh, what was our other option? Uh, uh, or eat it raw. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but uh, anyway, we talked about maybe, you know, this is roasting it over a fire. That's kind of the medium. It, 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 would, uh, it would take longer to boil it than to just put it on a fire and uh, cook it. It would take, be quickest to uh, eat it raw if you would like to do that. Uh, Sunday is potluck, by the way. Uh, but, uh, you know, maybe this is a kind of a, hey, be in a hurry, but don't be in too much of a hurry to leave before. But certainly by the time they eat it, there, you know, basically, if we could put this in uh, modern language, have your bags packed. Be, be ready to go before you sit down for dinner. Uh, it's the Lord's Passover. And then verse 12, uh, who is going to pass through the land of Egypt that night? The angel of death, the death angel, how do you know? Because that's what your Sunday school teacher told you. But if we read, he says, I will pass through the land of Egypt this night. So don't put the death angel, the angel of death, as some third party that God is going to send. He very clearly says, I will pass through the land of Egypt this night and will smite. Who's going to smite all the firstborn in the land of Egypt? God himself is going to do it. I uh, will smite the firstborn of the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and against all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgment. And just in case you're not sure who I am, I am the Lord. I'm coming through. I am doing this. Now, from some other passages, could we argue that 
he is going to do this through the death angel? Maybe, but I think you would have a weak case looking at the, uh, at the, at the pages of Scripture. I think we've kind of softened this a little bit, talking about the death angel, but we're sort of missing it. It really is, uh, the Lord is going to come through. The Lord is the one that is going to uh, do this work, and he's pretty clear about it here. Uh, and the blood shall be for you a token upon the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. And the plague, this was the tenth of the plagues, the plague shall not be upon you to destroy you when I smite the land of Egypt. Now, this is uh, as far as we're going to go in, uh, in this particular passage and learning this before we come into um, speaking more of the, uh, the modern uh, version. But uh, here he comes, and he is looking for the uh, token in verse 13. The blood shall be a token. A token is a sign. And when uh, God is going through and he sees the sign of the blood, where is it going to be? On the, on the doorpost. And specifically, it said, both sides and the top. Both sides and the top. Uh, so you might call it the doorpost and the lintel, and uh, it will be on all of them. We talked a little bit about uh, maybe some of the significance there that that uh, is uh, to life, uh, the, uh, the, 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 the word there. But whatever, whatever it is, it certainly um, doesn't really matter because that is the sign or that is the token that God says, I am going to pass over this house. Thus, it's called Passover. And uh, in Hebrew, Peshach, that is the word that means Passover. I'm not going to stop there. When I see the blood, I will pass over you, and the plague shall not be upon you to destroy you when I smite the land of Egypt. Now, this day, 14th day of the first month, shall be unto you for a memorial. You shall keep it a feast to the Lord throughout your generations. You shall keep it a feast by an ordinance forever. Okay, there is the instruction. Now, we, we originally started out in Leviticus chapter 23. Uh, here are your feasts that you're supposed to do. First of all, you're supposed to do the Sabbath, and there's a verse on that. And then he goes and says, and next, on the 14th day of the first month, you're to do the Passover. So this becomes part of the DNA for Israel. Israel is not Israel if they're not doing the Passover. We're going to skip, just for, t uh, the, for time, the fact that there were times when Israel did not do the Passover. As a matter of fact, remember Josiah, and Josiah couldn't sleep one night. Good King Josiah, remember, he couldn't sleep one night, and so he had the books uh, brought into him and sort of rediscovered uh, the uh, Torah and, uh, and the instruction, hey, you're supposed to do this. And so he reinstituted for the people of Israel the Passover, which they hadn't done in, uh, I don't remember the number of years, but uh, it had been a while. And they got away from who they are in their DNA. Now, I, suspo I suspect, anyway, that probably, this is a little bit uh, of, a, of a guess, but probably from the time they went into exile uh, up until this day, the Jewish people have not left off doing the Passover. They kind of learned their lesson as a, as a nation. Maybe in a lot of other things they didn't learn their lesson, but they certainly learned their lesson here because certainly as long as we can remember in modern days, and I'm taking modern days to be, let's say, from uh, the destruction of the temple in 70 AD up until today. Uh, it, it, we don't know of any time when the Jewish people did not on the 14th day of Nisan, come and, and, uh, and do the uh, Passover. Now, that then becomes part of their DNA. Now, w one of the things in, in uh, understanding how to rightly divide the word, and that means uh, figuring out what applies to you and what doesn't apply to you, uh, this shall be a memorial, you shall keep it throughout your generations, you shall keep it by an ordinance forever. If you don't know better, you might say, well, hey, this is in the same book as the Ten Commandments, right? And, uh, uh, you know, surely I should do the Ten Commandments. And if I should do the Ten Commandments, why should, if I should do chapter 20, why shouldn't I do chapter 19? If I should do chapter 19, why shouldn't I do chapter 12? I'll skip all the numbers in between. <laughs> uh, and you would begin to think, hey, maybe we're supposed to do the Passover. And some people, I think, well-meaning, put themselves into Judaism because they read a command like this that's uh, very clear. You shall do it forever. You know, it's, a, it's supposed to be an ordinance. And then maybe you would read... Uh, 
the book of Jeremiah, as a matter of fact, if I wanted to be a manipulative preacher, I would not do it here because you all are too well trained in the Taos Theological Seminary. But I could go to uh, the standard evangelical church, could I not, Brother Art, and, uh, uh, and uh, say, hey, here it is. We're, sub- we're, we're supposed to, the people of God, we're the people of God. We are Israel today. We're supposed to keep this. And then go to uh, Josiah, say, ah, oh, look, he wasn't keeping it. And he said, we ought to keep it. I wonder if there's a Josiah today, anyone Josiah today who says, people of God, let's start being the people of God. So I'm telling you, if no one else will step up, I will. I will be the Josiah for today. We're going to start doing the Passover. Amen. Thank you. <laughs> um, I, almost, I almost converted you to a Baptist, didn't I? <laughs> so, you know, you, you, you can get, if you're not well-trained, you can be snookered into putting yourself under something that's not yours. Because I, it wouldn't be, really be that I was teaching you something that was not in the Bible. I mean, there it is right there in the Bible. It would be that you wouldn't uh, know, you may not know, hey, wait a minute, just because it's in the Bible does not mean it was written to me, does not mean it was an instruction for me. So here is an instruction that uh, if, you, if you read the Bible literally, you won't get into this, because if you read it literally, you'll say, well, I think this is for Israel, the people who are uh, descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and that's not me. Uh, so, so this isn't mine. But if you, if you spiritualize it, you know what spiritualizing does, don't you? Make spiritual lies. I'll say that slower. Spiritual lies. <laughs> uh, you got to be careful spiritualizing it. And, and unfortunately, going back in, in Christian history, there's been a lot of uh, making the church, the body of Christ, to be Israel and therefore putting the obligations of Israel onto the church. Most times, like among Baptists, we picked and choosed that which was convenient for us from Israel to take on to us, definitely tithing, uh, <laughs> and all the, all the things that would uh, uh, serve us well. And we sort of ignore the rest, just don't read that uh, part and go on. And uh, I think the better thing is just say, if it's for Israel, it's not for us, uh, and, unless we can find another uh, instruction for us that says we're supposed to do that, and we don't have to do that. That's not, that's not ours. Uh, and so uh, we, we divide. Now, uh, that, that'll come up later as uh, we talk um, about modern Passover and about these uh, Christ in the Passover services. I want to give a few uh, thoughts on that uh, later before we close out tonight that uh, may or may not be popular thoughts, but uh, I have a gift at uh, making people mad. So let's talk about uh, the modern Passover a little bit. I have, um, I think I've only been to one Passover dinner. Uh, It was at the home of a Jew. They were not believing Jews. They were Jew Jews. (laughs) <laughs> they were uh, observant Jews, I guess, I, I guess would be the, uh, uh, the way to uh, say it. They were uh, the family and their friends that uh, were involved. Uh, Shelley and I were the only non-Jews there. It was a, uh, a, a group of uh, conservative Jews uh, that uh, invited us. And it, it really is a delightful time. And I would say, and it's a meaningful time. It's a, it's a moving time. And I would say, if a Jewish family invites you to Passover, say yes. Uh, go, and you, you will enjoy it, and they will enjoy having you there, and you'll learn some things, and you will you'll go away from there saying, that was, that was good, I like that. Uh, but now let's talk about some of those uh, things there. They use a book, I meant to uh, pull one up, you could find these on the internet, but be careful in doing so because there's a huge variety of what's in it. It's called the Haggadah, I believe I got that pronounced, uh, and that is a guide to the Passover Seder. The Passover Seder, Passover, you know what that is. The Seder, that just means order. We might use, probably not here, but in some circles you might use the word liturgy. Seder is like the liturgy. It's like the Baptist bulletin, okay? This is, this is what you do, and then you do the next thing, and then you do the next thing. That's what, the, that's what Seder means. Uh, uh, so it's their order or their ritual. Uh, these do, as I mentioned on the, uh, on the outline here, they vary wildly in emphasis because... 
Jews are like Christians. There's a bunch of different denominations of Jews. There's everything from the Hasidic Jew, which would wear the black and have the, uh, uh, the, the, uh, the, the curled uh, uh, hair on the sides, uh, and uh, you know what you think of as a, uh, an Orthodox observant Jews, to the next step would be kind of a conservative uh, observant Jew, law-abiding Jew, all the way to uh, Reform Judaism on the other side, even to uh, the equivalent of Christmas and Easter Jews, <laughs> you know, as far as you can go there. But, but, but some of Reform Judaism, some of her on the left side, the left side, um, they... Uh, they, they, they can get just as liberal as you could possibly imagine. Uh, so sometimes you download these uh, Haggadah, and you, if you want to learn about Passover, download one, and it might be full of social justice and feminism and everything else that's, uh, uh, that, that, uh, that you could think of in, in terms of uh, so the social left. And, and then other times it would be very conservative. If you, if you want a good one, I, I honestly would say uh, go to the Chabad website. Looks like Chabad. Right across the street, it's on the sign. You can read there if you would like. Uh, and uh, they're Orthodox Jews, and they would have a pretty decent uh, uh, Haggadah if you want to look at. Now, I've given you a picture on the outline of the Passover plate. Uh, that Passover plate, I should have done that in color so you could see that better, but that Passover plate, you've probably seen one if you've been around much Judaica, that's Jewish things. Uh, and it's a plate that has six, six spots in it. It's usually kind of a decorative plate, maybe a silver platter, but often a uh, ceramic with lots of uh, little scroll work art, and, and uh, it's a beautiful thing, uh, typically. It, the, the closest we would have as Baptist would be the, uh, the deviled egg plate. <laughs> but ours has 24 spots, <laughs> and uh, theirs just has six, uh, a little bigger around. That's kind of what a Passover plate. Now, you don't really eat from, your meal is not on the Passover plate. Uh, there's one Passover plate for the table. The Passover plate is the memorial plate, so to speak. Uh, and uh, it reminds all the family gathered around the table of these six things. I won't give their uh, Hebrew uh, names there, but it will have a shank bone. Uh, that shank bone might be lamb, or it might just be another, uh, another uh, bone uh, that uh, is used as a reminder of the Passover lamb. They do not eat lamb today. The reason that especially an Orthodox Jew would not eat a lamb today is because the Passover lamb you are supposed to sacrifice and you are, the only place you can sacrifice is at the temple and you're supposed to, uh, you know, uh, the, the, the priest is to be there to take the blood and whatnot. So you can't do that anymore. Uh, and so they substitute another meat. Typically, very often a traditional meat is brisket or roast beef or something of that uh, sort. But they will have the shank bone there to remind them of the lamb. Uh, then they will have a roasted hard-boiled egg, number two on the picture there. Uh, that is a reminder of the way in which the lamb was to be cooked. It is not to be boiled, and so this egg is not boiled. This egg is roasted. And uh, they may eat some roasted egg uh, that, uh, that night. They may not. They may just have that singular one there uh, that reminds them. You know, again, depending on which uh, Haggadah you, you select for the Passover Seder, some of them might get into things like, uh, you know, this reminds us of new life, or this reminds us of spring, or this. And, and you almost get into the Easter stuff like Easter Bunny kind of stuff, uh, depending on how liberal you uh, go with that. But the, uh, the, um, uh, the roasted egg is, is there to remind them of uh, the manner in which the lamb was cooked. Now, it would be interesting, and I don't know, and I know that some of my fundamentalist friends will tell me that the Easter egg tradition came from Ashtara or some pagan goddess, and it might have. But there's a possibility, too, that the roasted egg at 
Passover time, and you may remember we talked about last week how the word Passover didn't exist until William Tyndale made it because he needed something to put in there. Prior to that, they didn't use the word Passover. They used the word Easter, basically, <laughs> in Old English, in Greek, and excuse me, in German, whatever it is. So there's a possibility that that's where our egg tradition came from. I don't really know that. I'm just throwing that out, and you can do your research later. Uh, then they, numbers three and four are two, ty- two different types of bitter herbs. Uh, often it will be like horseradish in one and an onion in the other, something along those lines. This would vary from family to family. It doesn't really matter exactly what kind you have. It, the, the traditions would vary around the world depending on where you're from. Uh, But uh, the bitter herbs, uh, the first one, number three there, represent uh, slavery and the bitterness of slavery. The the next one, typically uh, onion in the United States anyway, uh, would represent, uh, I put slavery there, but it's uh, it's, it's another bitterness. Uh, Pardon me. It may be the bitterness of the journey. There, there's two bitterness they put in there, pardon me for, uh, for uh, not getting that correct on there. Then they will have, uh, and this is where, you see it on number five there, this is where a color picture would be better. It looks sort of like dark mashed potatoes there, you see that in number five? Uh, that is a, it, 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 it's whatever you want to make it to be, but it's got to be brown, okay? Usually it's apples, raisins, cinnamon, mushed together. Uh, it can be sweet, often is sweet, and they will some serve this, uh, you know, some as well, but they have that there to remind them of the mortar between the bricks, just to remind, hey, we were a slave people, we had to take the mortar, we had to put it in, uh, and, uh, and uh, put, you know, make the bricks and build the, build the uh, buildings. And then there's, there is uh, something typically like parsley, again, this can change, something that uh, will remind them of uh, hope and renewal. And uh, it is eaten by, when, when, when it's ceremonially eaten, it is taken, dipped in salt water to remind them of the tears that they had as they were going towards new life. Now, as you think of all that, uh, how much of that matches what we read in Exodus chapter 12? There's hints of it. You, you can see that this kind of came from the same thing. Bitter herbs, lamb, sort of. Uh, now, we do have uh, unleavened bread that is not even on that plate, but we're going to have some unleavened bread in a moment. So already you begin to see, okay, this is, something has changed since the days of the Exodus to now in the observance of the Passover. Uh, they do have the unleavened bread, the matzah, and... It is uh, actually three pieces, uh, three pieces that are wrapped in a cloth, typically, uh, and they're, it's always three pieces. Uh, they will take the piece called the um, afikoman, it's probably not pronounced exactly right, but the afikoman is the middle piece. They will, uh, at the beginning of the dinner, break the middle piece, put half of it uh, away, hidden typically is what they will call it. Sometimes they'll put it in a bag, sometimes they'll uh, put it in a cloth, uh, sometimes they literally will go hide it somewhere in the house. It's hidden away somewhere. And they will save that piece till the end of the dinner. And then often, at least in the United States, the children will go and, and, uh, and find it and bring it. And typically, uh, the child who finds it, they go, and then they negotiate with dad on giving it back. Uh, This is part of it. Dad, I'll give it to you if you'll promise me a new bicycle or a wagon or a, a, you know, a set of car keys, whatever, (laughs) whatever it is. And they, they, uh, they, they sort of bargain and get a gift uh, by giving the Afikoman back. Uh, That, that again would vary by family. Some families are going to be much more uh, religious and others are going to be, they're going to have kind of fun with it. And, And I wouldn't say that 
those who have fun with it are not necessarily being religious. I would say that there are some who only have fun with it, and it's just, a, uh, again, a kind of a, a social gathering, uh, much like we would have at Christmas when there are people who observe Christmas and they don't really care anything about Christ. Obviously, you're going to have that as well. But uh, they will take this and uh, save it. That, that broken piece is they will take then at the end, they will break that broken piece and give each person a little piece of it. Uh, the rabbi said it has to be as big as an olive. Um, no, it can't be smaller than that. So they will take that. They will eat that. They will do it before midnight. Uh, it's gotta, all this has got to be done before midnight. And uh, this is a reminder of the lamb that they would have eaten. They don't eat it. Uh, they don't eat lamb anymore, again, as we've talked about, but they, they would have eaten that, and so they take that as a reminder. Now, also in the supper, they will have four cups of wine. Uh, it is really obligated upon the Jew to drink these four cups of wine. And I might say, just in case um, anyone is offended, they do allow grape juice uh, for uh, those who need grape juice. The more liberal ones allow grape juice. Uh, I suspect if you went across the street and asked the rabbi at Chabad, I suspect that he would strongly discourage against grape juice. Wine is really what, uh, what uh, they will use and encourage. Uh, there are four cups, one uh, at the beginning of the meal, that is a blessing, Kaddush, they do this also on the Sabbath. Uh, it's a blessing and a sanctification for the day, basically, as they bless this wine and drink this wine, they're saying, this is a holy day. This is a different day than the other days. Uh, the uh, second cu cup is uh, consumed before the meal also while they are telling the story of the birth of their nation from Abraham. So they're talking about Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, uh, and uh, uh, how Isaac was spared and whatnot. Just a brief uh, telling. And this would be in the book. They would go through the book, and uh, it would tell them what to do, the Haggadah. Uh, and uh, then they would have their meal. Then after the meal, the third cup is consumed, uh, during the blessing of the meal, remember that Jewish, Orthodox Jewish people especially bless the meal after it is eaten, not before, though they do have a blessing at the beginning as well. But the blessing at the beginning is more a blessing of God, a praise, uh, a, uh, uh, than it is, thank you for this food. So after they eat it, they thank you for this food, and they drink that uh, third cup, and then the fourth cup uh, is uh, consumed uh, at the very end of things, um, I believe, and I may have these in the wrong order, that uh, Afikoman, that hidden piece, uh, I think they, no, uh, I got this right, okay, I had to think through it, sorry. Uh, they, will, they will have the last cup of wine as they sing a song, and then the last thing they do is eat the bread uh, and uh, carry that out. Uh, by the way, when we do the Lord's Supper, we do the bread, and then the wine. They're, they're just the opposite. At the end, it is the wine and then the bread. Um, now, some things we could talk about that if we had more time, but uh, we won't. I, I would not personally associate the Lord's Supper and the Passover. We'll save that for another day, but I, I, I would separate those two. Uh, and uh, again, we'll uh, take that another day. Now, normally around the table, they will have an empty chair. If they don't have room for an empty chair, they would have an empty cup of wine. Uh, a glass of wine, I guess is what you call it, right? I am a Baptist preacher. I know nothing about these things. Uh, but they would have a glass of wine. Uh, this is the Elijah cup or the Elijah chair. Remember that Malachi the prophet said, you know, before Messiah comes, I'll send, Mes I'll send Elijah. Uh, and uh, Elijah will come. Well, they, they have this view of Messiah coming, and so they hold uh, the Elijah chair. And as a matter of fact, uh, there is a, a time after the meal when the children will go to the door, uh, the front door of their house. They literally will open the door. They will uh, say a few prayers, but they're kind of, uh, what's, the, what's the word we use? Imprecatory prayers. Uh, that is kind of curses uh, on the enemy, uh, like you would read in the Psalms. And, and these come from the Psalms. They would say a few of those imprecatory prayers. And, uh, and uh, the, the idea, again, it depends on who you talk to, is that the spirit of Elijah may come in. What they're really looking for, the children are looking for, is, hey, 
is this year the year Elijah is going to come? Elijah, are you here? And the prayers are, God, avenge us from our enemies, uh, you know, take care of those who would uh, persecute us. And they do that. Now, typically, they will sit uh, on pillows. They'll put a pillow around, a uh, small pillow on the uh, cushions of the chairs. And... Uh, there's a number of different reasons on why they, uh, why they say they do this. This is obviously rabbinical tradition, but uh, m- the most common, I think, that you will see is uh, that, and this would be the orthodox view, that uh, we now are not in slavery anymore, and we rejoice by having this night where we live like royalty. Uh, and so, the, you know, we got the cushion on the chair. Sometimes it is reclining, uh, as you would do in the old Middle East, uh, reclining at the table rather than sitting. at It's not v- done very often here in the United States. Usually it's a uh, cushion. There are four questions that are asked, which I'm just going to let you read. Uh, but the children at a certain point, in fact, it's usually the youngest child there, uh, would uh, be... Uh, uh, called upon in a sense, it goes again, everybody has their Haggadah, their book, and it comes through and the, the child would say at some point, Father, may I ask you some questions? And uh, the child would ask these questions that would just take one of them. Of, of, on, on all nights, we need not dip any, even once, and on this night, we dip twice. Why? Okay, they're talking about the dipping into the salt water. And all of these questions, the, uh, the goal of the question is to tell the story of the Exodus. There is a, a reason uh, that they ask four questions, not five, not six, not three, there's four. And uh, this has to do with the wording of the book of Exodus, where four times it basically says, I will free you, I will release you, I will, there's four of those that say uh, that. And so they ask these four question, <coughs> questions, and uh, Excuse me, that gives the opportunity for the father of the house to basically tell the Exodus story. So again, if you go to one of these, uh, by the end, you'll say, oh, wow, man, I just, I I heard the whole story tonight. And you'll hear it accurately, again, typically, as long as it's uh, uh, done in a conservative uh, way. And then they will have the Passover meal, pardon me that I uh, left uh, that blank there, but uh, in the Passover meal, roast beef, uh, fish. Uh, you, it, it's, it's, a, it's a feast. It's a very nice meal that they uh, put out. And uh, they eat that meal and they celebrate and they do these things. Now, uh, with that, let's, uh, let, let's put some things together. Uh, and let, let me say on all those traditions as well, you know, we have uh, traditions on how we celebrate Christmas, right? Um, and um, uh, you know, I, I grew up in this part of the world, so it just doesn't seem like Christmas Eve if you don't have pasola and biscochitos. Uh, but there's probably, in fact, I know this because I moved away, you know, and I found out there's people out there that on Christmas Eve have like lasagna or something. Uh, and I'm thinking, what is wrong with these people? It's not even Christmas. Uh, my Christmas is ruined, you know, because I don't have pasola and biscochitos. Um, and especially Sarah Jeans. Uh, <laughs> uh, what do you do in Tennessee on Christmas Eve? Sometimes we have tacos. <laughs> Roasted squirrel. Uh, <laughs> tacos, okay. Uh, <laughs> it's kind of like the Um So anyway, we have our traditions And a few years ago, I did a study on the history of Santa Claus. You know, where did Santa Claus, how did he come into Western civilization? You know, surprisingly, that's one of my uh, highest viewed videos on the Internet. Uh, uh, I I think it's like number two or three or four somewhere up there in the history of Santa Claus. Uh, But uh, you just never know. Uh, You know, where do our traditions come from? You can sort of pinpoint a little bit or, or think a little bit, and then you get all the story, the other stuff that comes in. It becomes pretty hard to figure out uh, these things because as we start something, we don't really write it down, you know. Well, the reason we're doing this is because Grandma started it last year, and we just want to, you know, uh, uh, honor her memory. <laughs> you know, whatever it is that we don't write these things down, we just begin to do them. Now, in Passover, there is some of this. However, I would say that there's not a single ancient document. And again, by ancient, I'm going to go 
uh, first century and, and earlier. There is no ancient document at all that describes the Passover meal like it is observed today. So virtually everything about the Passover meal is different than it was in Jesus' day. We don't really know how Jesus and the disciples observed Passover. Certainly, we can pick up a few things from the Gospels and a few things from the Old Testament, uh, but I, I would suspect they don't have a pass. They didn't use the Haggadah, and they didn't uh, have uh, you know the Passover plate there with the six things on it and the shank bone. And all. They would have been having lamb, uh, no doubt, because the temple was still standing. Uh, and, and surely they would have had lamb, unleavened bread, and bitter herbs. Beyond that, how they did it, it's a little bit of a mystery. How they do it today, yeah, we know that, but how did they do it then? Uh, here's, there's a website called My Jewish Learning. Here's what they said. The arrangement of the table, the psalms, the benediction, and the other uh, re- recited matters of today coincide substantially with the program laid down uh, in the Mishnah, these are Jewish commentaries, in the Mishnah, and they were, at, were let's see, uh, t- t- laid down in the Mishnah commentaries, were added, and most of the versions we now have was completed by the end of the Talmudic period, 500 to 600 common era. So, uh, the Jewish people say, our modern traditions, let's say 500 A.D., Uh, This is where they uh, came from. Here's another one, uh, Rabbi uh, David uh, Galankin, uh, president of the Institute of uh, Jewish Studies. He, 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 uh, in fact, I'm not going to read the entire quote there. You can look. But what he he says is that the Greco-Roman symposia was the basis of the modern Passover. He's, he's convinced, and there are several others who are in modern days convinced. Now, the Greco-Roman Symposia was basically a cultural dinner uh, in, in, in Roman days. Uh, and it was a, a teaching uh, method of, in the Roman Empire in those particular days. We'll pray for you, Hallie. And um, uh, <laughs> with that then, uh, I, I'm always a little suspicious which came first, Did the Greeks get it from the Jews who were already doing it, or did the Jews get it from the uh, from the Greeks, the Romans who were always doing it? I don't I don't know. But anyway, the point is, what we describe tonight as the modern Passover is probably not what Jesus was doing uh, at the Passover. He might recognize it if he went in. He might not even recognize it uh, if he went in. Uh, I think the modern Passover, again, is beautiful. It's a deep observance. It's, uh, the Jewish people need to keep doing it. It reminds them of some things. They've got some traditions. I don't, I'm not saying it's um, unethical or unbiblical in what they're doing. I'm just saying it's mostly tradition. And, but it's a tradition that is serving its purpose of teaching them about the Exodus and reminding them about the Exodus. Now... Uh, with that, uh, let's talk about Christ in the Passover. Uh, if you look up Christ in the Passover, obviously, on the Internet, you'll find books, you'll find seminars, uh, uh, you'll find uh, observances in churches, especially around, uh, uh, you know, the springtime. Uh, I, I can tell you about uh, October of this year, uh, two or three or four Jewish organizations will call and say, hey, Pastor, uh, we're going to be in the area in March. And, uh, you know, we do these Christ in the Passover presentations. We would love to come and do one at your church just for a love offering. And, you know, I I kind of appreciate many of these organizations. They're Jewish evangelism organizations, typically. And sometimes, even like last year, I'll say, I tell you what, you can come, but let's don't do Christ in the Passover. You you got anything else you can talk about? Yeah, well, we can talk about the Holocaust. Oh, good, let's talk about the Holocaust. Why don't you do that? Uh, And sometimes they say, well, why don't you want a Christ in the Passover? And I say, it's a long story. And sometimes I give them the long story, and then they say, We'll just talk about the Holocaust. <laughs> I haven't yet convinced them, but, uh, uh, but I, I think, first of all, let me say, as the, as the groundwork here, there is absolutely nothing wrong with, with recognizing Christ as our Passover lamb, and therefore seeing the type or the foreshadow uh, of the original 
lamb and the blood of the lamb and all those kind of things that sort of echo in our gospel, you can certainly see that and that, that certainly is there. And I think we could even see it even if 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7 didn't literally call Christ our Passover lamb. So uh, Christ, who according to the gospel of John, died as they were slaughtering their Passover lambs, he became the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world, and, and uh, 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 you know, Christ is now our Passover Lamb. So, that is all good. Now, uh, I think the problem is that in, I will say, 100% of the modern Passover celebrations, uh, they, the, these, again, these traditions were developed long after the close of the New Testament, and therefore, I don't think we can use what they do in the Passover today as some revelation of Christ. And yet, when they bring these presentations, or you read the books or whatever, that's usually the way it is, is that, uh, uh, you know, uh, next Jesus would have taken from the uh, bitter herbs, and he would have dipped them into the salt, and he would have taken them, and they would have drank the fourth cup of the wine, and, you know, all, it, it'll, it'll connect all of those things that probably Jesus didn't do, as if Jesus did them, and then we'll all sit back in awe and say, oh, well, this is uh, just uh, so wonderful how you have Christ in the Passover. Uh, and uh, here's, here's uh, an example uh, that uh, we have, and I let's see, I think, uh, did I, I might have deleted the line that said, uh, oh, no, there it is, got questions. I just deleted the bullet point, sorry about that. Um, GotQuestions.org. Did you know it's not my favorite website? Uh, but, uh, but it's the one everybody goes to. If you, if you Google, you know, uh, Christ in the Passover, you'll get God questions. Here's uh, a couple of uh, lines of what they say, a couple of paragraphs. Uh, for example, they say, the matzah is placed in a bag called the echad. That's those three pieces of bread put in the, in, into a... Uh, put, put on the table together, placed into a bag called an echad, which means one in Hebrew. But this one bag has three chambers. One piece of matzah is placed in each chamber of the bag. The matzah placed in the first chamber is never touched, never used, never seen. The matzah in the bag is, uh, the, oh, excuse me, the second matzah in the bag is broken in half at the beginning of the Seder, Half, broken, uh, half the broken matzah is placed back in the achad, and the other half, called the afikoman, is placed in a linen cloth. Let me stop right there. Do you already see any significance uh, with Christ in here? There's three in one, and the middle one is broken and put in a linen cloth and hidden away. Ah, Christ in the Passover. N now, just keep with me here. Uh, so the afikomen is placed in the linen cloth. The third matzah in the bag is used to eat the elements on the Seder plate. Uh, I didn't mention this. As they eat those bitter herbs, they put it on that third piece of matzah there. Uh, many Jews consider the three matzahs to represent Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, but they cannot explain why they break Isaac in half or where they place half, why they place half in the, uh, the middle matzah back in the ehad and keep the, other half, uh, keep the other half out wrapped in a cloth. Okay, so God questions, paints this wonderful scenario. This, this is, represents Christ. And the Jewish people don't know why they do it. They think it's Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, but they can't even explain it. Okay, that's the idea. The problem with it is they very much cherry-picked. You could find some homes that would have a bag, cloth bag, with three compartments, and you put one in each. You, you could find those and you could buy them. And it would be called an ahad. You could also find... I would say far more often you would find in a Jewish home, they just put three pieces on a plate right there. Uh, you could find where 
all of them will break the middle piece, the afikoman, uh, you could find where they take some of that and they wrap it maybe in a napkin, a linen napkin. It just happens to be linen and they wrap it in the linen napkin and they hide it away there. Some put it in a paper sack, some go stick it in the cupboard. Um, so cherry pick to make this sound, ah, oh, this is Christ broken and buried and hidden in a linen cloth. And uh, I think that it's presented by God Questions and by these other organizations, presented as this is the standard practice, this is the way that Jews do the Passover. The problem is, you know, pinpointing what a Jew does at Passover is as difficult as pinpointing what we're going to eat on Christmas Eve. Uh, they're just broad, wide uh, observances that are done in the manner in which they are done. Uh, now, according to the Chabad website, uh, this uh, Orthodox Jewish ministry again, here's what they have to say. Now, remember, before I read it, that the Jews can't even tell you why it's Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Okay, here's what Chabad says about the Af uh, Afikoman. Uh, it says, the Afikoman, that's the broken piece, represents our liberation from Egyptian exile. That redemption, however, was not a complete one as we are still awaiting the final redemption with the coming of Moshiach, that is Messiah. Setting aside or hiding the larger half of the matzah reminds us that the best real redemption is yet to come, still hidden in the future. You know, honestly, I like the Jewish... Uh, answer better than I like the Christian answer. The Christian answer seems to me like we made up a bunch of stuff to sort of, honestly, kind of propaganda. The, that we, we picked a few pieces here that, yeah, they got three pieces of matzah. Yeah, they break one. Yeah, they hide one. Uh, and we fit that into our mold where I think there is real meaning in the actual observance of the feast that we as Christians don't have to kind of rob that and take everything Jewish and baptize it, so to speak. Make it, uh, make it, we can let it be Jewish and remind them of the Exodus. Uh, and, uh, and, and I think when we do that, we actually do better Jewish evangelism because we respect uh, that which they believe and that which way they do and carry out. And, uh, and, and we certainly believe in the Exodus and whatnot. So I think we've got uh, some uh, problems here. Uh, so uh, notice, by the way, uh, in that, I've given you the uh, uh, URLs at the bottom of the page. In that Chabad uh, article, nothing is said about Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, those three, and about not touching the first one. In fact, all the pictures you see on Jewish websites, I should say all the pictures I saw on Jewish websites, the three pieces are just laid on a plate. So the whole thing about the first one is never seen or never touched. Eh, you know, I'm, that's, that's true in the Christian observances of the Passover, the way the, those organizations do it. Is it really true in the Jewish home? Not usually. Uh, and so again, God Question says they can't explain why they break it in half. Oh. All you got to do is Google it on a Jewish site. <laughs> you find, oh, they really do have an explanation for it. That's not a bad explanation. And furthermore, it's a tradition they have. In Exodus, it doesn't say... You know, you must have three, you must break the middle. This is not a biblical observance of the three. It's a cultural observance of the three and uh, can carry those out. So my conclusion on Christ and the Passover observances is there's too much agenda-driven propaganda and not enough truth. There are better ways to uh, teach Jewish belief and to do Jewish evangelism than, uh, than these. So uh, with that, I will close out because I'm out of time. And... Uh, uh, I will say, you know, probably some of you, I would, I would be, be surprised if there's nobody here who hadn't been to one of these Christian observances of Christ in the Passover. And my guess is it was kind of meaningful. You sort of liked it. That was, uh, you know, that was, uh, whoa, wow, I didn't know this. Uh, and I don't really want to rob you of that. Uh, and, uh, and yet what I, what I do want to say is let's be careful as Christians not to take the Jewish feasts, make them the Christian feasts, and sort of, in doing so, we sort of put the Jewish people as, again, you know, they're that stub stubborn, stiff-necked people who never will be right with God. Uh, and, and we paint this uh, a little bit of an anti-Semitic picture, and we do this replacement theology saying, oh, this, this Jewish thing, it's really all about us. 
<laughs> it's about our Savior and, uh, uh, you know, Christ being uh, died and being buried for us. Uh, now, again, the Bible certainly does say Christ is our Passover. And, and it, again, it wouldn't have to say that for us to notice when you're talking about the lamb and the blood uh, and uh, life given and death pa passing. You, you know, it, it wouldn't take a uh, rocket scientist let me say this different. It wouldn't take a theologian, a rocket theologian, <laughs> to see some connection and some significance there. I am really convinced that the more the Jewish people uh, observe their law, the more they're going to see their Messiah, because it points to their Messiah. And seeing their Messiah, they get the full resume of their Messiah. Someday they're going to look and say, well, my goodness, that matches up with the resume of Jesus of Nazareth. I think he's the one. <laughs> and better just to let it be a Jewish thing. So, you know, again, I would say, as I said in the beginning, uh, if a Jewish family invites you to a Passover, go for it. Uh, if if uh, a Jewish organization wants to do Christ in the Passover at uh, your church, I would say, do you have a presentation about the Holocaust? Uh, yes, sir. Well, there's, there is that possibility. So the question is, do uh, Messianic Jews or Jews who believe uh, in Jesus as Messiah, do they believe that broken second piece is first coming, second per coming? Probably. Uh, though, again, there's so much variance among J Jews that you would run across some there, too. But also, then, let me say, uh, do you remember the legend of the candy cane? The three stripes and uh, white right and red, and I don't remember, but, you know, sometimes at Christmas you get a little card with your candy cane, uh, and there's the legend. that you, you can check that out on the Internet, too. Uh, but... But a lot of Christians don't believe in the legend of the candy cane or don't think anything about that. My, my point is, both of them are just traditions that we made up. They're not, neither, none of them are biblical. So I wouldn't be surprised at all if some Messianic Jews, who I think Messianic Jews, by the way, ought to observe the Passover. They're, they're a part of this nation that's supposed to do it forever. And uh, uh, they ought to remember coming out of the Exodus. And, and in doing that, you can't help but say, who is the one that saved us from the Exodus? And guess what? He's our Savior here today, too. So, so, so to bring that out, I don't think would be a misuse of the Afrikaman. Uh, I, I, again, I just don't think that... Uh, I think we want to be careful not adopting too many of those things uh, as ours. And that is how we rightly divide the word of truth. Never on time, but that's how we do it. Uh, <laughs> and with that, let me... Uh, Close. Heavenly Father, thank you for uh, helping us to understand in these last two weeks the Passover a little bit. And uh, what, a, what a rich tradition it is for the Jewish people and what a blessing it is uh, for us who, uh, who are able to see it. And dear Heavenly Father, I think you, uh, you, you understood man that uh, sometimes uh, initiating some kind of cultural observance and tradition is a needed thing for uh, those of us who are in humankind. And... Uh, so we pray, dear Heavenly Father, that uh, even our own traditions would be those that are God-honoring, that are biblical, but that, that we would never uh, raise tradition to the level of uh, Scripture and the revelation that's given to, to us in the Word of God, for which we're grateful and most grateful for Jesus Christ, our Savior, who indeed has given us liberation. And uh, we rejoice in this. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. Sunday morning, 945 is... Um, is, uh, what is it? Philippians. And 1045, uh, worship and um, the mysteries of the Bible, part two. And potluck following that. <laughs> I'll see you all uh, soon. God bless. And we have men's breakfast in the morning if you all would like to join us. If you men would like to join us. <laughs>